Sometimes I still text my mom, good night cow jumping over the moon. So what if good night moon wasn't a comfort story? What if there was something more sinister to that old lady whispering hush? That is what is explored in today's feature Friday book, The Upstairs House by Julia Fine. And like I did with The Gilded Ones, I'll probably just slip the cover up so I don't have to like Vanna White it because I am not Vanna White for sure. So this book, we follow Megan, a young, well, I guess we don't really know her age. I'm projecting. We follow a new mother, Megan, as she is just given birth. We see her in the hospital and as she adjusts to new motherhood. But quickly we see the kind of isolation and horror of motherhood explored as well from one of her first interactions in the hospital where she is asking her mother and her husband to do something about that red balloon, which is the first kind of Margaret Wise Brown uh, trickling, right? We see that red balloon in Good Night Moon. This book <laughs> is bonkers. And I would like to say too, that I know that this is probably gonna be a pretty polarizing title. Julia Fine's first book, What Should Be Wild, was also pretty polarizing. If you look at the reviews online, they're not great. That being said, I loved it and I'm okay with that. It was set in the woods, it had a liminal space, it had weirdness, and I love oddity and weirdness in my narratives. And this again, leans into that, but in a much different way. And it also explores the horror of motherhood. I know that this isn't gonna be for everyone and that's okay. I really enjoyed it. That being said, it does also deal, it deals you know, with postpartum things. I'm not a mother, so I'm coming at this with someone who has not dealt with that. So I don't know, you know, that experience and how that may be portrayed. It also deals with mental illness in a way that I don't feel comfortable speaking on in terms of whether or not it's an accurate, fair portrayal. So if any of those things are things that make you go, I don't know, this may be a pass for me, that that's just, you know, what it is. Because I don't know that I would describe this book as bringing me joy. It was uncomfortable. It was hard in terms of its subject matter. And the main character wasn't likable. And I really want to explore that. And I think I will do a deeper dive into kind of unlikable characters, especially unlikable female characters later. And I want to see we're seeing that this light is really catching my bad skin. What you gonna do? So this, I talked before, especially with like the divines as kind of a recent memory, comparable experience in terms of how I feel some narratives push the unlikable and the unlikable characters kind of merge with this really edgy prose or it feels like the the narrative and the prose is attempting to shock me or put me on edge in some way and in that in those cases I don't always respond to that super well as a reader that's just not something that really is an effective for me again personal reading experience because I know many people that works for this for me worked and it's that I think the narrative was so it was odd but also it, it almost some of these things felt like intrusive thoughts this is this is really hard I think because Megan is a mother and there are certain things that are explored in here that we don't like to think about in relation to motherhood there is a, a, a part where she has some kind of violent intrusive thoughts about her baby and that is not something that we think of or want to think of in relation to motherhood but I also think that it explores how isolating motherhood can be and how there is this idea of motherhood and then the reality of motherhood. So in this Megan's husband goes away for a week and that's kind of where everything really starts and that is important. I, I did read a review that was like, oh, it's convenient. The husband is always gone. But the husband 
for me, always had to be gone. There's this fine line between, is this real? Or is it some kind of imagining? Is there some kind of disconnect? That's kind of the high stakes of this novel, right? Is this happening to Megan physically? Or is she conjuring this? And does one become less dangerous than the other? So while she's home, she encounters Margaret Wise Brown, the renowned children's author. And I will admit, I knew absolutely probably less than nothing about Margaret Wise Brown as a human going into this. And I don't know that I still know a whole lot more, except that she had a very tumultuous love affair with a woman named Michael Strange, who I, that was the pen name. I don't remember her given name, who was a socialite in New York and at least I think 20 years older than, than Margaret if I'm tracking the timeline correctly. And so Megan is kind of haunted by these two women. Now, why these two women? Uh, before she gave birth, Megan was in a doctorate program and she was working on a dissertation about early childhood education and literature. That was interesting too, because I didn't really get the sense from the narrative that Megan was compelled to be a mother. It was a thing that kind of just happened. And she was like, okay, we're gonna have this baby, but she never really felt maternal. And I think that's an important piece as well, right? How do we think of mothers? What expectations do we put on mothers? How does our individuality become subsumed by this new human? And that's at the heart of this. So the Margaret Wise Brown piece a little bit feels like her dissertation kind of coming into play. But Michael also comes in and Michael doesn't feature too prominently. She's kind of just in the footnotes of Margaret Wise Brown's pieces. And it's interesting because we, you know, we get flashbacks as well, chapters about them. And when I say tumultuous in the relationship, I would also probably classify it as an abusive relationship because Michael is so demeaning to Margaret and so dismissive of her work and often her as a person. But Margaret was a poet. Not sorry, not Margaret. Michael was a poet. And so she so she thought of her art on kind of this higher playing field. And she was constantly demeaning Margaret for just writing those children's stories. And why won't you grow up? But Margaret's work is the work that has endured. So when we first encounter Michael, she's this kind of disembodied energy. M Megan describes her as an anger, and she's seeking out Megan to kind of establish her story or to reclaim her piece of history. So it was interesting because, and I, this is like very, very rudimentary analysis at this point. I'm sure things will continue to percolate, and I'm sure there's some stuff I'm just not smart enough for. But Margaret and Michael both kind of felt like identities Megan was struggling with, especially in terms of this anger and this resentment. And Margaret was almost standing in as a maternal figure, even though she wasn't. The form of this book is split up into different parts. There are are back and forth. I don't know, like the format, I felt like I should have been tracking more how it worked and whether it made sense or how impactful I thought it was. Cause I don't know that all of the parts really worked together. Like some sections were interspersed with Megan's thesis and others were back and forth between Megan's timeline and Margaret and Michael's timeline. They, all the M names are another reason I think that like we might be playing with different identity versions anyway. Anyway, but I don't know that I tracked any real consistency there. And this is where it goes into like, do I care? And that is a completely subjective thing. And I recognize that there are times that I might sit here and be like, this was a problem for me. This wasn't consistent. It threw me out of the world. And I just read another book recently where I was like, there, there was something missing with the structure. There was a missed opportunity. But here I could recognize that there may have been a missed opportunity, but I don't know that 
as a reader it took anything from me. I was trying to piece together how it made play but into things but the the world was just so odd and unsettling that I went with it. And it was interesting because I expected to fly right through it and I found myself picking it up and putting it down a lot more than I anticipated. I both wanted to devour it and languish in it and I found myself kind of repeating because Julia Fine would like slip these like really deep ideas into the middle of something completely bonkers and I was like wait I have to go back to that idea though like she's arguing at one point with like Margaret and Michael and there's things are escalating and it's about Michael wanting to get her story told and she'd written an autobiography at one point and she said but autobiography as a genre is a trick of smoke and mirrors selfhood is reflexive autobiography performs and it doesn't feel like it's beating me over the head with that idea right like it doesn't like there are these ideas that could so easily be performative or over overly profound to on the nose and I don't feel that way about them I feel like it's like huh let me sit with that for a second let's just stay here for a second figure this out and that's a common theme of the underbelly of this book is what is reality and how is reality shaped earlier in the book it says but wasn't everything performative? What were we if not constantly refashioning ourselves into what we wanted the world to see? And so I got like the artistry of it. It talked about like how our, how our legacy endures, what our legacies are, and to mirror the artistic legacy with the legacy of a child was incredibly impactful for me. Like that worked. And at one point, Megan said that she didn't have the feelings to be an artist like she knew that art was how you persisted but and she had the words but she didn't have the feelings and I was like and I had to put the book down and then just sit there for a second and the the artistic side of things the form the performative nature of things was interesting because like I said I think that this book is interesting because it takes the form and gets to play with it. It's not just a standard linear time line and it plays and it's very clearly a novel. I don't know that it could be anything else but I also found myself thinking about it on the stage in a way that I wouldn't think about it in another medium because it does do so many innovative playful things like I can picture the good night moon room at certain points, setting up this kind of emotional space. And like, imagine like a stage that looks like the good night moon room. And that's kind of like mentally where things were playing out. And so I was picturing a lot of design choices and how this moved and it was being innovative with form in a way that on stage, you can be a little bit more innovative. Some of my favorite plays play with that kind of thing because you can play more, you can be less literal than it. you almost have to be on screen or you have to set up very clear expectations right away about what you're doing. That's a lot to say that I think that the writing evoked a very specific mood and tone through its I, design choices isn't the right word because it wasn't a design choice, but it sets things well and it spirals and builds. You can feel the danger kind of escalate and it all kind of root comes back to how do we view things? What persists? What is the strength of language and how does language shape things? And that comes back, you know, with Michael and Margaret as well. We think of Margaret Wise Brown. She is a children's author. She's very to the point and stripped down in her language in that way and again I don't have any background in early childhood education or children's literature so this is all very kind of off the cuff thoughts here but the the book talks about how Michael was a little bit more overwrought in her writing there was there's a difference in language there and which one persists which one do we still have 
it's there's just a lot of ideas here and it's bonkers and it's hard and you're not gonna like Megan most likely and I was also fascinated by the focus on this time in women's lives that I don't think we really see focused on as much this like new motherhood and how scary and isolating that is and again I'm not a mother but I'm fascinated by narratives that explore the relationships between mothers and daughters because that's also another whole thing here both Megan and her daughter and Megan and her mother and that relationship between a mother and a daughter I think is often fraught in its own way there's just so much here I know I'm just skimming the surface of all of it this is very short but it's very layered and there's a lot going on but I also want to make clear that the language is completely approachable it, it's very readable it's just weird and that's what I wanted so that's a good in the meantime yeah if you've read this let me know what you thought and otherwise I guess if you haven't read it let me know the thing in Goodnight Moon that you think could be the creepiest in a horror scenario I don't think we get all of them I distinctly remember no cow jumping over the moon which is great for my texts with my mom but let me know read something good and bye.